Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of his grace. The riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In him we also have obtained the inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also having believed you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right side of the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all the things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. By the way, this is the very first uh, sermon that will be heard up at our Spencer Creek campus on, uh, on the screens. So I want us to take just a moment here in the very beginning and say hello to the rest of our family up at our Spencer Creek satellite. Can you put your hands together and welcome those? Come on, let them hear you. That's right. We're so thrilled that the Lord has uh, given us a new campus pastor there, Pastor Drew and Megan uh, Dunbar, and we are so thrilled to have them as a part of our church family and also the rest of the family at Spencer Creek. So we, God's got great things in store. So this will be the first sermon that I'm preaching there at the same time that I'm preaching here. So we just give God praise for that. We are going to be going to the book of Ephesians. So I want you to go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Ephesians, and if you need a little bit more light to see that, I want you to stay right there with me in Ephesians, and uh, keep, your, you know, keep your notepads handy, because I want you to, to write down notes, and uh, we're going to go through a Bible study for the next several weeks. We're going to go through every single verse. How many of you think that we're going to learn something, all right? We're going to go through every single verse in the book of Ephesians. I'm only going to cover 14 verses if I get the time today. That's my goal is to cover the first 14 verses of chapter 1, and then we'll pick up next week where we left off. We'll start with verse 15 and keep on going until we get to the very end of the book. I've told a story that I want to tell again because it's one of those... Um, Moments in my life that were milestone moments for me because it was a life-changing experience for me. Several years ago, I was uh, ministering to the military 
on a journey across Europe. I was doing, I was ministering in seven different uh, countries over there uh, to the military, and one of our stops was in Italy. And that particular day, we were taking a tour day, just as a little break, and the Navy chaplain who was taking me around on this particular day through Italy took me to Rome. And I was so excited about being there and seeing Vatican City and all the, all the great uh, history and culture of Rome. And so we went through Vatican City and saw, you know, the Sistine Chapel, the, the great paintings of Michelangelo and, and, and St. Peter's Square and all the amazing things at Vatican City. And, and honestly, I was in awe of everything because it was just some of, the one, you know, some of the wonders of the world were there and some of the greatest collections of religious art and mosaic in the world. And, and my tongue was just hanging out the whole time because I was just in awe of the whole experience. But to be honest with you, I wasn't moved uh, emotionally. It was more of, uh, of an intellectual thing where my mind was just stimulated with all of these facts I was trying to absorb and all this history at the same time. And, and we kept seeing, we saw the great Colosseum and some of the, some of the other uh, great historical places of Rome. And because I didn't read any of the Italian signs, I really didn't know where we were going. And the Navy chaplain says, you know, Dr. Cutshaw, I want to take you over here to a place and show you one more place before, you know, we go find dinner. And so I have no idea where we're going, and we go into, uh, we go into uh, to, to this small little church. It wasn't anything really impressive. When you leave Vatican City, it's hard to get impressed, you know, with anything else because there's so much there to see. And, and we go inside this little bitty place that has a hole that has a spiral staircase in the middle of the hole. And they didn't tell me where we were. I think he wanted to surprise me. I know he wanted to surprise me. So I just start holding on to the rail and walking down the spiral staircase. And he ended up in this hole in the, in the ground. Now, it was three floors below or three stories below ground level. And so we're really, really deep in the earth, and I'm in a little room that was like a, uh, like a, a cistern or a little cellar because I couldn't even stand up in it. I'm 6'2", and I'm trying to stand up in this cellar and this little room, and I can't. I'm walking around kind of, you know, stooped over like this, and, and I still don't know where we are, and I'm thinking, why has he brought me into this hole in the ground? And all of a sudden, I have this flood of emotion that I had not had previous. I mean, I've, I've been in Rome. I've seen the great inspirational places of the world, and I have not had this emotion. And, and I'm not usually much of a crier, but here I'm standing here in this dirt floor, and I began to weep. And the next thing I know, I'm touching the walls all around me, and I just want to know where I'm at. And I look up at this Navy chaplain, and there's tears streaming down my face, and I said, where am I? And he said, you are in the cell of the Apostle Paul. And in that moment, I had a transitional moment, a paradigm shift spiritually because I realized in that moment what holy ground is really all about. That it was not about uh, all the great paintings and the inspirational things. All of those things do inspire us. But God's presence is the thing that changes us. And there's a big difference in being inspired by God and being changed by God. And the power of God that still rested in that dirt floor and on those dirt walls was still so, uh, so, so present in that room that it, that it literally affected me emotionally because the power and presence of God was there. So I just want to stop here and say something for a moment as we go into this text that when Paul writes the book of Ephesians, he's writing it from that jail cell. He's not writing it from a church. He's not writing it from a comfortable office with a Mac computer and, you know, his, his, uh, uh, his cell phone at his side. And, you know, he's not checking his Facebook while he's writing it. The Apostle Paul is three stories down in the heart of the earth in a room that you could not stand up in. But he wants to encourage the, the, uh, the church in Ephesus to continue on in the faith and unlock mysteries for them. So I want you to get the setting of where Paul is at. As a matter of fact, he writes several books there. He is, uh, this is around 63 AD, and, and he is also writing to the Colossian church. And he also writes the book of Philemon there. And if you, if you know the book of Philemon, 
Philemon, it's about he's asking an owner of a slave to set a, a slave free and let him serve God. And he allows the slave to go free. And so this slave, because Paul has made this appeal, he comes and he serves the apostle Paul. So here is Paul in the bottom of this, of this jail cell. And he's writing these books to these churches, and he's giving them to Onesimus, this, this young man who's serving with him. And Onesimus is taking these letters out to these churches and, say, and telling them, this is from Paul. He's bound in chains, but this is from the Apostle Paul, and he wants me to send this letter. So that's how these letters got delivered and how we ended up with the book of Ephesians in our hand. Now, when you get to verse 1, Paul begins verse 1 in Ephesians one by telling you that he is an apostle. Now, the thing you need to understand about this is that people use titles today to impress people. You know, I'm doctored this or bishop this or, or, or apostle this or psalmist. You know, we use titles so that we can show that we've earned something or that we're important. But that is not why Paul is using this title. As a matter of fact, Paul does not even want to be an apostle. Paul does not want the assignment that he has. You have to remember how the story of Paul starts. His name is not Paul when it starts. His name is Saul. As a matter of fact, he is called Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus is a very religious man, a very educated man, who's a member of the Pharisees and a Roman citizen, and he is spending his life going around locking up Christians because he thinks that this new sect of, of religion, this group that calls themselves Christians, he thinks that they're heretics and that they're going to ruin the, the true Jewish religion. So because he's Sadducee and Pharisee related, he is wanting to stamp them out. So Paul has one goal in mind, kill all the Christians, lock them up in jail. So here's the guy that's busting down front doors of Christians. He is separating mothers from their children and fathers from their children, accusing them of a heresy gospel. And here is the guy that now is on his way to Damascus to do some more of this kind of work. And on the road to Damascus, he's going there to kill Christians. He's going there to, to lock Christians in jail. But on the road to Damascus, riding his mule, a light from heaven comes down and knocks him off the mule and blinds him. Now, we don't know exactly how this happened. But in this experience, Paul is laying there flat of his back. This light from heaven is shining on him, and he sees Jesus. How many of you know that when you see Jesus, it changes everything? He meets the one he is persecuting. Guess how Jesus introduces himself? Saul, it's me, the one you're persecuting. It's Jesus, the one you are going around persecuting. I'm the one that knocked you off your beast. And I'm the one who's come here to call you into ministry of my service. This experience was so life-changing for the Apostle Paul that this man who is on his way to lock up Christians, he is now blind, he's helpless, he's groping around through Damascus. Somebody takes him in, they know he is, and God speaks to one of the saints, one of the few saints in Damascus. He speaks to a little man by the name of Ananias, and he says, go lay your hands on the Apostle Paul. I'll tell you where the address. He's in a house on a, on a street called Straight. He said, go there and lay your hands on him that he may receive his sight. And Ananias doesn't want to do it. He says, oh, wait a minute, God. Do you know who this guy is? Are you sure? I mean, this guy, it's a setup. I can tell you it's a trap. When I go in there, there's going to be Roman soldiers like there always are. They're going to lock me in jail. This man is going to kill me. Do you really want me to lay my hands on Saul of Tarsus? And the Lord says, listen, I have called him into my work, and I have also given him the hardest assignment that anyone is ever going to receive. He said, I have put a thorn in his flesh because he's been persecuting the church. 
church for the rest of his ministry, this man is going to suffer the same persecution that he has that he has put on the church. But he will be faithful, and through his persecution, through his suffering, he will bring glory and honor to me. So you got to see this radical shift that is going on in the religious world. Here is this man who is the front line leader. Here is this guy who is the head of the rebel group who's a Christian killer and a Christian hater and he's telling everybody that Jesus is a false prophet and now because he has seen the resurrected Lord, he's been he's had a heavenly visitation. This man has now received his sight, not just his physical sight, but his spiritual sight. He walks out of that house and the first message he preaches is Jesus Christ has come to die on a cross. He has resurrected from the dead and you need to believe on him as the Lord of your life. Isn't that a radical turnover? Now, Paul had to study for a while before he could start preaching because he, he was so anti-Christian that he had to get a, a little bit, of, a few sermons under his belt before he could get out there and start preaching. So when he begins this sermon, or this, this, this letter, rather, to the book of, of, of Ephesians, the book, to the church of Ephesus, he wants them to know that he's an apostle, but not out of arrogance. He's saying, I'm an apostle because I have no choice. What he's telling you and what he's telling me is what he told the Corinthian church when he said, he said, I have, have to preach the gospel under compulsion. Because God will not allow me to do anything else with my life. I have a debt to pay, and God has called me to be a missionary and an evangelist to the Gentile world. Now, here's the thing that you've got to understand about the price this man pays for the gospel. I'm going to read to you one quick scripture out of um, out of. Uh, First, Second Corinthians, I'm going to read out of verse 11, and listen to this, because there, here are some of the things that Paul endures just to be an apostle. Now, now remember this, he did not ask for ministry, he, does, he didn't want to be, he already had one going on, but not this kind. But God calls him into a very tough style of ministry. And listen to what he says, here is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 22. Let's go down to verse 20, see, verse uh, 23. He says, are they all ministers of Christ? He says, listen, I speak as a fool. See, there's a lot of people that they think that ministry, if ministry is not comfortable and pays well, they don't want to do it. They view ministry more like a job or more like something they've earned the right to do. And sometimes even in, in ministry, even people that do ministry, they and now I don't know a lot of people like this, but some people that, that do ministry, they, they don't understand that ministry has to be a calling. It cannot be a profession. It has to be a calling of God on your life. Because the Apostle Paul says, listen, God has called me into the kind of ministry that I have to be so tough. It's not what I want to do. It's not what I'm choosing to do. But listen to this. He said, I have become a fool. Everybody in my family thinks I have lost my mind. I have become a fool because Jesus Christ told me I have to spend the rest of my life with this thorn in my side. What is the thorn? It wasn't blindness. He was healed of that. It's that everywhere he went, he got beat up. Every city he got in, they would stone him, throw him in jail, or beat the living daylights out of him. So listen to Paul's personal testimony. Now, he doesn't have a prosperity testimony. You know, thank the Lord for those that do. That's not Paul's testimony. Listen to his testimony. He says, he says, I speak as a fool. He said, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. He said, I've been in prisons more frequently, in death often. He said, from the Jews, five times, I've received, I've received the 40 stripes minus one. You know, the same beating that Jesus took right before the cross, the cat of nine tails for 30, with the 39 stripes of the Jews, Paul had to endure that same thing five different times. Go through that very same thing. Listen to this. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and when they stoned him, they thought he had died. As a matter of fact, that was in Lystra. They drug him outside the city gates because they thought they had stoned him to death. 
and they want they thought that he had died and the holy spirit revived him there outside the gates of Lystra listen this three times i was shipwrecked a day and a night i have been in the deep in journeys often i have been in perils of water perils of robbers perils of my own countrymen here are all the people after him perils of the gentiles perils in the city perils in the wilderness perils in the sea perils of false brethren Perils of will of weariness and toil and sleeplessness, uh, sleeplessness and hunger and in thirst. I've had to fast all the time. I've been naked half the time. He said, besides all of that, you know, when they were throwing him in prison, they were stripping him and beating him and throwing him in prisons naked. So you think about this guy and all of this, he was doing this to be in the ministry for Jesus Christ. Besides the other things, now I can't even imagine what that means. You know, he has given us this list of torments that none of us can even comprehend because it's so vast. And he says, these are, only, these are the only ones I'm telling you about. He said, there's a lot of other things that I haven't even mentioned that I've gone through. Like he'll tell you later on in another place that he was thrown to the lions in, in, the, in the Colosseum. And the lions ripped him up, but they didn't kill him. Now you think about preaching the gospel and staying faithful. No wonder the man said, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, and I kept the faith. I mean, he was not a quitter. He did not give up. What grace had to be upon his life to go through such torment and beat and, and being in prison most of his ministry. But guess what? He wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer of the Gospels. The apostles didn't even accept him as an apostle. As a matter of fact, he would get, he would get with other, of the 12 disciples and they would always get into arguments because he wanted to be included. And they said, no, you can't be included because you weren't trained by Jesus like we were. He said, that doesn't matter. I saw the resurrected Lord on the road to the Damascus, and he's the one that appointed me and called me. So you got to understand, this book is coming to us at great cost. This is not just a nice little poem. This is not just a nice little letter. This man almost died on a continual death journey just to bring the gospel to us. Now look at what he says. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice he, he, he associates himself with Christ because that was the one he was against. By the will of God. And I'm writing this to the saints at Ephesus. Now, the saints at Ephesus are not like the saints that we would be more accustomed to in our, our lifetime where someone is recognized for doing great work in ministry and they achieve a title of sainthood. And, and you know, sometimes you see their pictures and there's gold plate around the back of their head. And, you know, we create these halos and, you know, we talk about, or maybe it's a sweet little person in your church who said, that's a saint. No, he is talking to a different type of group. He writes this letter to Ephesus because he has a history with Ephesus. And I'm going to tell you that history in just a moment. He's been preaching there for two and a half years. There has been a huge riot. And every Christian that stands up for Christ is walking out of their house at, at, at a risk of being mobbed and beaten every time they walk out of their house. So when he says, you're saints, he says, I'm calling you saints because of the faithfulness of the group at Ephesus. They were not weak. They were not watered down. They were not whiny. But here is a group of people at Ephesus that even though they were at great risk every single day of their life, they kept on going to church. They kept on singing their praises. They kept on studying the scriptures. They had been kicked out of the synagogue. They had been kicked out of their homes. They were not allowed in most of their businesses. But for the sake of Jesus, Christ, this groups held themselves together, and they stayed faithful against all the opposition. And Paul says, that is why three levels down from ground zero, three levels down from the earth, I am in the midst of a cell. They have stripped my clothes. They have beaten my back. I'm chained to the walls, but I am going to take the time to encourage the group at Ephesus that has hung in there and kept the faith. So this is a letter of encouragement to the faithful who never gave up on God even though troubled times came their way. Can you give God praise in this house this morning? If you want to know the story of Ephesus, you have to start back at um, Acts around chapter 18. Paul, 
his ministry was unusual in the fact that because he wasn't welcomed anywhere, he would just go into a city and go to the Jewish synagogue and start preaching Jesus. Most of the time, they beat him up. A lot of times, they stoned him. A lot of times, they put him in prison. The same thing he was doing to everybody else. So he would go into the, and that's his whole ministry. How would you like to uh, change ministries with the Apostle Paul? No takers this morning. I don't see any takers. No, that's his ministry. And so he goes into a city. He starts preaching Jesus openly in the synagogue, and then he just lets the Word of God have the power to change someone's life. And so on this particular occasion, the church at the, the synagogue at Ephesus, the Jewish synagogue, was a little more open. They gave him a little reception. They said, all right, you know what? We're, we're open-minded. We'd like to hear a little bit more about this man, Jesus. Why don't you come back another time? So Paul said, all right, I've got somewhere else to go. And when I get through there, I'll come back and preach to you again. So if you go into Acts chapter 19, you see that, that Paul came back. This time they let him preach for three months. But at the end of three months, all the priests in the synagogue decided that they didn't need any more of this kind of preaching. We've tried it out. We've let you preach for three months, but we don't want you preaching anymore. So they threw him out of the synagogue, and everyone, they said, okay, today you got to make your choice. Either you're in or out. If you want to hear more preaching about Jesus, you got to get out of the church. So how many of you are leaving, they said. Well, there's a few people said, well, you know, I want to hear a little bit more. So Paul takes a little bitty group, and he plants a church in a school. He rents a school, and for the next two years, he preaches to all the people in Ephesus in this school. And when he does, there is a great revival that breaks out. People start getting healed. Now, on one occasion, the people started getting healed of, uh, of, of magic spells. And, and because they were all doing magic, and they brought their, they brought their magic books in, and they piled them in a pile in Acts 19. You can see this story. And they burned them. And when they burned all these books, the Bible said the value of just those books alone was, was 50 pieces of silver. So look at that. That's a lot. That's a great, great value. And that's a lot of silver. Jesus was betrayed for a wealthy sum of 30 pieces of silver. These magic books that are being burned are 50 pieces of silver. So look at this. Now a great revival breaks out. When you get into Acts chapter 20, Paul is now upset the whole town. As a matter of fact, so many people are getting freed from demons, so many people are getting set free that he is ruined a business, not just one business, but several of the businesses in town. Now, I don't have time to read all that for you, but I want you to go into Acts 19 a little, a little bit later on and read that for yourself, Acts 18, 19, 20. You can read Paul's whole journey with, with, the, with the church of Ephesus. Now, in, in chapter 20 of Acts, Paul is now in this, in this town, and the business people are angry at him because he has stopped all the idol worship in town. This town survived on making silver item, idols and selling it to the people. Their biggest idol was Diana, the god of Ephesus. And she was the goddess of the Ephesians, the one that they, they dedicated the whole town to. And they had even stopped making her idols. So all these businessmen got together and said, listen, this preacher has been preaching in this school for two years. He has upset the priest. He has upset the synagogue. Let's kill him. And they set out a plot to kill the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul had to leave Ephesus. And the, here's, here's the story, Acts 20. This is power. I mean, this is, I want to tell you guys, they just don't make tough people like this anymore. Because when, they, when the church came to Paul and they said, listen, they're going to kill you. you got to leave. You know what he said? Read it for yourself. Acts 20. They've tried to kill me before. That's no big deal. I'll just stay and preach. No, you can't stay and preach. Paul didn't even want to go. He did not even want to leave, and the people of the church, the faithful believers, made him leave town to spare his life, and he didn't even want to leave. He wanted to stay and preach, even though there was a threat on his life. He wanted to stay and continue the work of God. So he leaves and goes to other places, and he has to come back eventually and minister to them, or he wants to come back. Even in his farewell address to them, he cannot be allowed back in Ephesus. they got a posse waiting on him. 
helm. They've got gu- they got six guns that are, are six shooters waiting on uh, at the gate. And if there's any sign of the Apostle Paul, they're going to take him out the first day he comes in. That I, I don't know about you, but that is one kind of revival, isn't it? Have you ever been anything like that? It's shutting down businesses, setting people free. It's taking over a whole town. It's absolutely amazing what was going on. So here is his here's here is the reason that Paul is attached to the Ephesians because the group that is there is there under great oppression. They are remaining faithful to the Lord in the midst of every kind of adversity that you can imagine. They are leaderless, but they are not powerless. They are without their teacher, but they are not without their Savior. And he continues to lead them on in their house churches and wherever they meet in the name of Christ. So Paul, even though he knows he's going to die because he tells them he has a meeting and he has a meeting on, uh, I believe it was Malta or Miletus, one of those areas around there, and calls the leaders of the Ephesian church together. And he says to them, I've got to go to Rome and I'm going to die. The Holy Spirit's revealed it to me. When I get to Rome, I'm going to die. But he said, I'm going to send you a word of encouragement. And there in that cell, he writes the book of Ephesians to go back and keep this faithful little group strong and to keep them going in the power of God. You know what? If you know somebody like that that's been tough in their work for God and they have just, they have just been one of those no-nonsense persons that said, hey, you can't offend me bad enough that, I won't quit, that I, I'll quit working for the Lord because God has called me, God has equipped me, God is counting on me. Can you just help me say thank you right now for every person that God has used like that, that tough breed of people that kept us going all these years. Amen. I'm going to hit this kind of fast, but I want you to, I want you to continue going with me into a, a couple of more of these verses. But I, I won't have, uh, I may not get to verse 14 in this one this morning, but let's, let's see how far we can get. He also says to them in verse 2, grace and peace from our God, from from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The one thing I want you to understand about grace and peace is this: peace comes from the grace of God that operates in your life. When you receive grace from God, that allows you to give grace. See, if you don't give grace, it's because something inside of you probably feels unforgiven. Because if you really believe that the Lord has forgiven you, you are so, you're first in line to forgive somebody else. Because the grace that's in you brings you peace. So if you're looking for peace outside of grace, you're not going to find it. Paul couples these together every time he writes to any of the churches to remind them that your peace comes from your grace. And what does grace mean? Grace means you do get what you don't deserve. Grace is the gift of God that's been given to every one of us. That is Jesus Christ, God's gift that came down to every one of us. And grace means that that because you accept Jesus Christ, you don't earn him, you cannot work for him, you you never are going to deserve him. No, you accept Jesus Christ and God's love in your heart by accepting Jesus Christ. And if you believe on Jesus Christ and accept Jesus Christ, Christ, then the grace of God is extended to you, and the peace of God will flood your heart. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Going on to verse 3, look at this. Paul just breaks into a little praise session here. He just stops in the middle of everything and says, listen, God's been so good to me, i got to stop right now and bless his name. I mean, that's really all this verse is about. He just stops. He, he's just, he is so excited. Here he is, chained up bound up in a prison. He can probably barely get his hand free enough to write. He got a little bitty candle, and he gets so excited that his soul and his spirit has been blessed. He gets so excited that one of these days he is going to meet Jesus in the air, that he is going to, I mean, he's the one who writes in in 1 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, where he says, the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Right there in that prison cell, he wrote, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. He wrote right there, he, had, he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we're able to ask or think according to the power that works within us. 
Now that brings a whole new perspective to those scriptures. When you understand this man is stripped and beaten and chained, and he's writing those kind of powerful words when he's been cut off from society in solitary confinement. And here he is. He's writing to them in the middle of his writing to encourage Ephesians. He just stops and says, well, bless the Lord. I just got to bless the Lord for a moment. He's been so good to me that you may think I'm chained, but my chains are going to be for his glory. You may think I'm bound, but I am bound, but the word of God is not bound. He said, you may think that I'm in obscurity, but I can tell you that Jesus can go anywhere he wants to go. And if God can save me, God can save you he just had to stop for a moment and say you know what worship is about who God is but praise is about what God has done Uh, and and I don't know about you but when I think of his goodness and all he's done for me I just have to stop for a moment and praise God because he's been so good to me and bless me and Paul said you may think I'm sitting in a cell but I am sitting in heavenly places you may think I'm sitting on the ground but no I'm really my soul and my spirit is sitting Sitting on the throne of God, my spirit is soaring in high places in the Lord. Hallelujah. Boy, that's a whole new kind of Christian, isn't it? That's amazing. Now, as we continue on in verse 4, I want to just spend just a real quick, a real quick moment explaining something that really trips a lot of people up in their theology. It's a it's a it's a theology called predestination. And I know that predestination may not be the most exciting word in the world. But when you understand it, it really is pretty exciting. Because you've got to understand what it means. In, in, in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1 verse 4, Paul introduces a doctrine that now is a doctrine in all of Christendom. He says, just as he chose us in him, everybody say in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, I don't have time to continue to read all of those, but what I want to talk about real quick are verses 4 through verse 14, about 10 verses there. And I really want you to get this because this is so powerful. We have to get this. See, a lot of people believe that predestination simply means that you have no choice. Because God's already determined who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. And if you got up this morning and and stumped your toe, well, he knew that was going to happen too. and, And you really have no free will. I think sometimes it takes greater faith to wrap your head around the fact that the sovereignty of God and the free will of man can coexist together. I mean, it'd be easier to say one or the other, but it's hard to say both. It'd be easy to say, well, God knows everything, and so you don't have any choices anyway. He's already picked it all out, and you know, we're kind of in this big checker game. Well, that'd be easy to say, or it might be easy to say, well, you know, God's just waiting on you to make up your mind, because you know, whatever you do, He's just going to help you with it, and that's all man's free choice. But when you put those two together... What a powerful thought that God's sovereignty is also a part of my choice. You see, predestination is not the same as predetermination. Predetermination means that everything's already been predetermined. But see, predestination means that the destination of every choice is going to be predetermined. Let me break it down to you this way. I think it'll help you understand it. How many of you have a GPS? Or you got a smartphone, then you got a GPS. When you have a GPS, you put in the address. And if you got one of those that talks back to you on your car, then it will say, turn right and 100 feet, turn right. Or mine's a girl, so you know, mine's just a lady that says that. We actually have a name for her, and you know, when she helps us out. So, so, uh, and so you can hear that voice saying, turn right. When you put in your destination, this GPS routes you to get there. Now, you can make a wrong turn if you want, but you know what it says? If you make the wrong turn, uh, readjusting your route because we have to get you to the destination. So we are readjusting your route. Can I tell you that when you choose Jesus Christ as your Savior, your destination is heaven. 
and God is going to reroute you as many times as he has to reroute you to get you to heaven because your destination has been predetermined that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you need to understand that God is going to do whatever he has to do to get you back on track. God is going to do whatever he has to do to get you back on journey because when you say Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life, you get a spiritual GPS and the Holy Ghost walks with you and talks with you and gets you back on track as often as it takes to bring you into God's presence. Your destination has been predetermined. Can you give God praise for his word this morning? Amen. How does this happen? He says there's only one way for it to happen. See, some people believe that God's already chosen who's going to get saved, so why try? No, I want to tell you. Some people believe that, you know, God, God is, he already knows your heart. He already knows who's going to pick and choose whatever. So it's already been determined who's going to be saved. No, I believe that that is true to, to some extent. Because I believe that God did predestine for people to be saved. He did choose us. But who did he choose? That's the big question. Okay, did I get chosen? Did you get chosen? Am I the elect? Are you the elect? Then who got chosen? I think I can answer that question this morning, so I'm so glad you asked it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever will should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love the word whosoever because it includes anybody who calls on the name of the Lord. Yes, God did choose But who did he choose? He chose everybody. But now it's my time to choose Jesus because when I choose Jesus, I get the the destination that he promised. When I choose Jesus, I get the inheritance that he promised. So this is how God's mystery unfolds. God said, how am I going to win the world? How is everyone going to go to heaven? He says, I've enveloped all of that in one person, and that is my son, Jesus Christ. And he said, if you will choose him, then you can have everlasting life by choosing Jesus. See, some people, they're so afraid of Christianity because they think I'm never going to be good enough to be a Christian. Don't you let God worry about that. He's a very patient and loving and faithful God. Why don't you let the Holy Spirit take care of all of your shortcomings? Why don't you get started with Him and wake up every morning knowing that Jesus Christ is your Savior and let that be the beginning? Because listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says that God chose us. Look at verse 7. In Him. Everybody say in Him. In Him we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sin and the riches of grace. Who did God chose? He chose anybody who chose Christ. God chose everybody who would choose Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Why did God do that? Why did God send his son? Oh, I can tell you why. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. As a matter of fact, even in this very passage, he will tell you in this next verse that God that God chose us because of his love toward us. If you look back in if you look back in verse 4 and 5, it says that because of God's love he predestined us in verse 5 it says because of God's good pleasure he predestined us in verse 6 he says because of God's grace his gift he predestined us in verse 7 and 8 it says because of the riches of God's grace it means God had so much love to give he just wanted to give it all away now unless you have grandchildren you cannot relate to this but I got two little babies that are the loves of my life and can I tell you that as a grandparent you have you you'll never have have more fun going broke in your whole life because every day they just got to walk in the room and you just lavish your love on them. They don't have to do one thing but stand there and be cute. I mean, they don't have to say anything. They just walk in the room and they could even be in a, in a snippy little mood, but it doesn't bother you, you know, because you just love being with them. And, and that's why grandparents spoil their grandkids. And that's why I'm spoiling mine. So leave me alone. I'm enjoying every minute of it. It's my right now to spoil them. It's their parents' job to correct them. It's Well, anyway, no, it's my job too, but I love lavishing grace on those babies. 
I love pouring out gifts to them and giving them things. That's why God sent Jesus. That's why God chose you. Even before you chose him, God is so full of love that he loves to just pour his love into your life. God wants you to be his child, and God just wants to pour the richness of his grace over your life. Can you give God praise this morning? And when I choose Jesus Christ, there's benefits. It says, in him, verse 7, I have redemption through his blood. In him, verse 7, I have forgiveness of my sins. In him, verse 7, he says that I have the richness of his grace. In him, he says in verse 10, he said that we are called up together with Christ. In him, somebody say in him. In verse 11, he says we have an inheritance in him. Somebody say in him. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know there's a lot of gospels, but Paul said if you preach any other gospel, he said it's not the true gospel. The real gospel has got to be about one thing, that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. He's ascended to the Father and he's coming back to judge the world and collect the saints. He said any other gospel is sinking sand, but that is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And the apostle Paul said... If all you do is accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, he said, you will be saved. In him you trusted. That after you heard the word of truth, maybe you're here at church for the first time today. And you know what? You don't have to, even if you choose not to fill out the card, which I hope you will. If you hear the word of truth this morning, it can set you free. If you believe the Holy Scriptures that you've read this morning and you say, today I want to put my trust in Jesus Christ, he said that's one of the benefits of being saved. But then he says in verse 14, our final verse, he said there's another great benefit. He said that we are guaranteed of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Let me back that up one verse because you got to get verse 13. In him you also trusted after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also having believed you were sealed. Everybody say sealed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What is that seal? He said that it is a guarantee. Everybody say guarantee. That means that when you accept Jesus Christ, the seal of God, the king's ring that is placed into the clay, the king's ring has put a seal upon your life that you are God's purchase. You are God's possession and that your life will bring glory to him. Some people say, does that mean once I'm saved, I'm always saved? Oh, you got to keep making right choices. You cannot go into sin so that grace can abound, the Bible says. No, but I'll tell you this. Once you are under the grace of God, the Holy Spirit will travel with you and will come after you. If you've ever accepted Jesus Christ, I can't say once saved, always saved, but I can say this. Once in grace, always in grace. When you come to Jesus Christ and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, the grace of God will pursue you for the rest of your life. Even if you walk away from him, he will never walk away from you for the rest of your life. The Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee that you must arrive to your destination, will keep coming back to you and back to you and back to you over and over and over. Yes, I know some of you may have children who have walked away from their faith. But can I tell you, the Holy Spirit will never walk away from them. Some of you may have grandchildren who've walked away from their faith, but I can tell you, the Holy Spirit will never walk away from them. He will be at their side, hunting them down. And maybe that's strong words, but some of them need to be hunted down. He will find them wherever they are, whatever stool they're sitting on, whatever car seat they're riding in, whatever bed they're sleeping in. The Holy Spirit will always go back to them and say, listen, you shouldn't be here because it's a guarantee. You've been prayed over. You've accepted Jesus Christ in your heart. That's why we dedicate our children, because we want the Holy Spirit to keep bringing them back to God over and over and over again. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet and give God praise this morning for his word. Amen. 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 I love a good mystery, but I especially love a mystery 
that surprises me at the end when I couldn't figure it out. My family would tell you that I'm kind of uh, loud, not loud, but when I watch a mystery, I'm talking to the TV. I'm always trying to figure it out. Yeah, I saw what you're doing. I know what you're up to. You don't, you don't have us fooled. I'm always trying to analyze it and think ahead. That's part of the fun for me. I want to see if I can figure it out before the end. And I love those movies that stump me. And at the very end, I didn't see it coming. That's exactly how the mystery of God's will unfolds. That in the mystery of God's plan, everybody says, how is God going to do it? How is everybody going to get saved? By one way, by choosing Jesus Christ. By choosing Him as their Lord and Savior. The mystery of God unfolds this way. God created us and made us because He loved us and He wanted a family. But He knew that we could be saved by Jesus Christ shedding His blood for us. And here's all you have to do. Here's how the mystery of God unfolds. If you accept Jesus, you get the redemption over your life. His blood redeems you. You get you become the possession of the Lord. The Holy Spirit seals you, and God's GPS keeps bringing you right back in to your destination every time. You want to find God's will for your life? Fall in love with Jesus. It'll bring you into God's will in your life. You don't have to wait on somebody to tell you specifics. No, if you're in love with Jesus, it'll just keep bringing you on the right path. You will end up in God's perfect will if you are madly in love with Jesus Christ and doing His work. You will end up in God's will. Whether you think you figured it out or not, you will end up in the right place because your destination has already been determined if you choose Jesus Christ.